This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Stacey Clardy from the Salt Lake City VA in the University of Utah. Today on the podcast, we're joined by Nicola D'Souza. Nicola is a postdoctoral fellow at Mount Sinai in New York, and she's the first author on a paper published in Neurology. It's titled Neuropsychological Profiles of Deployment-Related Mild Traumatic Brain Injury, a Limbic Sensi Study. And that's an acronym, the Limbic Sensi. It's L-I-M-B-I-C-E-N-C if you're going to look this paper up. Nicola, let's get right to it. Traumatic brain injury, or TBI for short, as I'm sure we'll call it, it's a huge concern for many members of society, but especially service members and veterans. And certainly the little bit of clinical experience I have in this space, it's complicated, right? Because these brain injuries, especially when happening in our military service member and veteran population, are intertwined with traumatic events related to deployment or other things that happen in life that could lead also to post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD as we call it. And they're often comorbid, right? It's important to parse out the contributions of a TBI from the contributions of PTSD in order to best support and treat service members and veterans. So that's why I love what your group is doing. You basically sought to identify neuropsychological profiles of mild TBI and post-traumatic stress disorder among this cohort. I I didn't really know much about I'm hoping you'll tell me. It's the largest service member and veteran sample to date. It's called the Long-Term Impact of Military Relevant Brain Injury Consortium-Chronic Effects of Neurotrauma Consortium. That's that whole limbic sensey thing. So tell us first, who is actually included in this population you're studying, this limbic sensey cohort? So the limbic sensi cohort includes U.S. service members and veterans who have experienced combat, mainly during military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. These individuals have varying levels of exposure to mild traumatic brain injury, so including those with no TBI, those with injuries that are related to their deployment, others who have injuries unrelated to that deployment, and then a group of individuals who have both types of injuries. And about a third of the sample also has post-traumatic stress disorder. And the sample that we focused on in this study was over 1,600 service members and veterans from this cohort. Wow, that is a large size cohort. Tell me if I'm right here. You could potentially capture someone who served in Afghanistan, had a TPI in active combat there, came back, is now out of service or still maybe in the reserves, potentially deployable, and they're just maintaining an active lifestyle. So they're playing a sport and then they had another mild TBI. And so you're able to capture and differentiate that. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. For every individual in this cohort, they undergo a very thorough life history of traumatic brain injury. So we can capture all of the injuries they may have sustained throughout their lifetime. Great. So a real life, actually applicable population. I love it. With that context in mind, how common of an issue is TBI, PTSD, and the overlap for modern military members and veterans? Does this happen frequently? Yes, TBI is incredibly common amongst this population. It's often called the signature injury of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. And it's estimated that around 10 to 20 percent of military personnel who face combat have experienced TBI, with most cases being mild. And among those who have suffered mild TBI, up to half also meet criteria for PTSD. Wow. Okay. So this is not something that's rare. This is commonly experienced by our veterans, especially of the more modern conflicts. So with that in mind, appreciating you're trying to answer a complicated question, as I understand it, about how the two interact, TBI and PTSD, tell us what you found. We examined how service members and veterans rated their physical and psychological functioning, along with how they performed on cognitive tests to identify different patterns or profiles of functioning. And these profiles ranged from high to low in terms of self-reported functioning and cognitive abilities. When we considered whether they had experienced 
mild TBI or showed symptoms of PTSD, we found something interesting with those with deployment related mild TBI, often ending up in those lower functioning groups and also being more likely to show signs of PTSD. But then on the other hand, those without mild TBI or those with non-deployment related mild TBI tended to be in those higher functioning groups and had a lower chance of having PTSD. But I also have to say that there was a lot of variability with some individuals who had sustained TBI, who had criteria for PTSD, still falling into those higher functioning profiles. And so these findings together highlight that service members and veterans can experience a wide range of symptoms and levels of functioning depending on the type of injury and whether PTSD is also present. And so while diagnosing these conditions can be challenging, closely examining their functioning and cognitive abilities can reveal important differences related to mild TBI and PTSD. So by identifying these unique profiles early on, we can better tailor treatment plans to better support recovery and improve outcomes in our service members and veterans. Okay, so tell me more about that last bit. So and how we intervene, how we act on this. What I'm understanding is it really matters how and when you acquire your TBI. So potentially the force of, say, the, the brain injury could be the same, but it's affected by whether you were deployed or not during the time you acquired that injury. And, and that's interesting to me. So with what you've learned, I'm fortunate to work at the VA in neurology. So I want to know, what do I do with this information in my clinic tomorrow to help our service members and veterans? And, and I know maybe this is a bit beyond the scope of, of just identifying the issue that, that you published in the paper. But if we know that TBI acquired in combat, for example, is more likely to lead to PTSD and a worse outcome, c- can we intervene on that? What, what are some of your thoughts about how we can make a difference for the veterans in real time? To better support service members and veterans, we should move beyond this traditional diagnostic labeling and focus more on a personalized approach. So this means looking at each individual's overall functioning and cognitive performance to tailor treatments specifically to their needs. So instead of worrying about diagnosing them with a mild TBI or PTSD when they come into the clinic, It's really about taking a step back and assessing the whole picture of how they're doing physically and mentally. And this helps in pinpointing who might benefit from certain therapies or rehab strategies early on. And additionally, I think it's crucial to work as a team. So to collaborate with other clinicians, psychologists, rehab specialists, and other healthcare providers to create a comprehensive treatment plan. So by forming multidisciplinary teams, we can ensure that all aspects of the patient's needs are addressed, leading to better, more coordinated care. And this approach has the potential to not only improve the effectiveness of treatments, but also support a smoother and more successful recovery for our service members and veterans. Let's get the team members in. Let's focus on the symptoms. And... Our podcast listeners will recall, we've covered this before. For example, we had the TBI and Cognitive Decline in Veterans podcast back on October 2nd, 2023, where Alex Menzi was talking with Marianne uh, chanty Ketterol about the association between TBI and cognitive decline. Now that was in the older veteran population. And so this is actually a great follow-up to that because now we're talking about some of our younger veterans and how we can perhaps head off some of what we heard about in that October 2nd, 2023 podcast. And similarly, it, it ties in with the podcast we did a secret war back on January 18th with retired Colonel Ling about how many subtle and, and difficult to characterize mechanisms there are to really acquire TBI in combat. And so maybe we don't necessarily even know some of them. And while I think as neurologists, sometimes we want to know the exact time and mechanism of the injury, what I'm hearing you say is, yes, take that history, get a gestalt that TBI and related PTSD might be happening here. But treat the symptoms. So along those lines, two things I want to follow up with. Remind us what are those symptoms that the veteran or active duty service member might be telling us about in clinic that should make us think absent of a history, absent of knowing their deployment history or their other head injury, potentially history. What are the symptoms that they should say that are going to make us think that this is something that's going on and we need to act on right away? So many veterans and service members might struggle with ongoing cognitive issues, such as trouble with memory, decision-making, 
slower thinking and difficulty focusing. They could also experience physical symptoms like headaches, dizziness, fatigue, and sleep problems, along with mental health challenges like depression and anxiety. And I'll just say that even though we call this a mild TBI, it doesn't suggest that there's quick recovery. The reality is that these outcomes after mild TBI can vary widely. So these issues may be going on for a long time, persisting for months or even years, depending on factors like their age or when the injury occurred or how we see in this paper, the context in which that injury occurred. And classic signs of PTSD include being easily startled, feeling constantly on edge, or being hyper aware of their surroundings. However, these symptoms can also overlap significantly with those of mild TBI, which is what makes it challenging to diagnose and treat when both conditions are present. For example, both PTSD and mild TBI can cause fatigue, irritability, and memory problems. That's really helpful. And certainly when I'm in clinic at the VA, in that context, when I see sometimes a veteran who seems uncomfortable in the room, who seems like restless, not really at ease, maybe they're often standing up and walking around a bit and it's not due to pain. These things come to mind, but Really, this is relevant because increasingly veteran service members, they're being seen in community settings where it may not be as obvious or they don't have the context clues in that setting to make it apparent that that this should be considered. So these reminders and the symptoms you just listed, that's quite helpful. Related to this and how do we help what are some of the resources available that, that you're aware of, either via DOD or, or VA? And I guess related to that too, can folks still participate in this cohort of yours? Sure. The Department of Defense, through both the Defense Center of Excellence for Psychological Health and through Traumatic Brain Injury, have really great resources. So both offer tons of helpful information for clinicians, and those involved in research and kind of reporting the latest evidence-based research and guidelines. For service members, veterans, and their families, there's a lot of educational material available that covers everything from recognizing symptoms to coping strategies and prevention tips. And it's a wonderful resource for understanding and managing TBI and related challenges. And those resources, I think, think are freely available, right? So that can help not even just nationally, it's outside the VA for any doc in any setting, and I believe internationally as well, right? Yes, absolutely. And then as far as the cohort, are you still recruiting military and and service members? If I mention this, so many of the veterans, they always want to continue to serve, which I always find really just tremendously humbling. And they will often ask me, so I've had this TBI, is there anything I can do to help future veterans or other veterans or service members, can they still participate in this cohort? Yes, they can. And so this study is recruiting service members and veterans from across 11 VA sites across the United States. And there is a website for the Limbic Sensi study, and we'll have information about how to participate. Great. I think sometimes even participating in and processing and and doing the interviews can be treatment in and itself. Nicola, this has been very helpful in terms of framing how to approach these patients, but also for me in understanding that the timing, the setting of a TBI really matters. And especially even ones that have traditionally been characterized as mild. And we have an opportunity to intervene, of course, intervening the sooner the better. And I've also learned from you, maybe not to obsess so much about the details or the mechanism or the timing when I'm trying to treat in real time. Did I get all that right? Yes, that's exactly what the paper suggests is think about what their the symptoms and functioning patients are demonstrating and focus on that, treat that, look forward to what treatments and help we can provide them rather than trying to pinpoint their exact history or um, their past. It's really about looking forward. Anything else that we didn't cover that we should be aware of? Anything else you've come across and you've learned from this study that you think might be beneficial as we're approaching this population? 
I think one really interesting thing that came from this study is just how we came to this question in the first place. So the idea for this study came from our clinicians who noticed significant differences in how injuries and symptoms present, especially how PTSD can influence these symptoms. So for example, two patients might have a history of mild TBI, but while one might recover quickly, the other could suffer from long-lasting symptoms. And so we wanted to put this clinical observation to the test in a large and representative sample of service members and veterans. And overall, we confirmed our clinician's suspicion that generally the symptoms did differentiate participants as expected based on their clinical diagnosis, but that there was also this range of functional levels within each diagnosis. And that is why they have always focused on the symptoms, their levels of functioning, their cognitive performance, and that focusing on that might be better method to identify what treatments and what's the next step in helping those service members and veterans recover. I didn't know the history of where this study came from, but it makes perfect sense, right? The best, most relevant and important questions always come from listening to the patients. <laughs> so glad to hear that the team did that, as always. And thank you so much for your time. Again, if you would like to learn more, and the paper is really just full of all the details about stratifying patients based on their experiences. The title of that paper is Neuropsychological Profiles of Deployment-Related Mild Traumatic Brain Injury, a Limbic Sensi Study, and that's published in Neurology. You can look it up right now. Thank you so much, Nicola. Thank you for having me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.